The unexpected breakthrough of the front line in November 1942 caused real chaos in our area. All personnel of the Luftwaffe units, cut off from their main units, were gathered into assault battalions, without distinction as to flight or ground personnel. Whether you were a pilot or an ordinary soldier was of no consequence. The same thing happened to me. I remained a liaison in the cauldron. At that time, outside the cauldron, my unit was defeated in heavy fighting. I found myself in an assault battalion, in the company of almost 400 new comrades who were complete strangers to me. We took up positions in the gully of the Karpovka River. A gully is a dried-up riverbed, and Karpovka is the name of a village, a river and a station at the same time. The enemy was less than 500 meters away from us behind the railway embankment. We dug into the banks of the parched river, but these burrows did not save us. From our hiding places we could see how Kadyusha, or as it was called by soldiers, Stalin's organ, was beating on us with a deadly battle. Just one salvo of these anti-aircraft missiles doomed about 50 of my comrades to a quick and slow death. In order not to be cannon fodder for them we had to go out at night to hunt for Russian weapons, which was also accompanied by bloodshed. So bad was our ammunition supply. Shot, wounded, frozen every day hundreds of young Germans died a senseless death. But things were the same with the Russians. Some of us chose suicide as a way out of this desperate situation. The rest of us lived every day in mortal fear for our lives. Our daily ration most often consisted of one piece of bread. We could make something more substantial out of the garbage. One day we found potato peelings, real potato peelings on the berm of our commander's dugout. We boiled them, and since there were quite a lot of them, it turned out to be a festive dinner. And then we found something else a dog. We couldn't believe it, but our major kept a dog and this was such a poor provision for the soldiers. All of us were unanimous in the opinion that this luxury had no place here, that's why this unfortunate animal quickly migrated to our hungry stomachs. A most shameful misdemeanor, which the strict commander wanted to crown with a court-martial. But he could not find the guilty party. Day after day passed in mortal fear until Christmas. That evening, the commander issued another order. The Fuhrer would get us out of the cauldron, he must even visit us here. And then the usual empty words about courage, bravery, the last drop of blood and loyalty to the Fuhrer. He was ashamed of the fact that it was beneath the dignity of a German soldier to put a bullet in his forehead. In the first days of January, our Major shot himself. But more than orders, we were helped by a consoling sermon, which was read at Christmas by our Catholic priest not everything is over, we are in the hands of God and his Son, born today. We must never forget that, and we must always remember each other. I proposed if one of us manages to survive this hell, on the day of his salvation he should always eat what we ate here every day just one piece of bread. That's how we will remember each other. The priest did not get that chance. He died the day after his sermon. On January 7th, I was wounded in the arm. I saw a Russian sniper about 300 meters ahead of me. When I was brought to the infirmary, only 16 of my battalion of 400 men were alive. After the operation without anesthesia I was told that in heavy fighting my unit was completely destroyed. Because of the advance of the Red Army, all the wounded were hastily loaded onto open flatbed trucks on the evening of January 10th and sent further east. The Russian gun cannonade was audible throughout. When, in a blizzard, sitting in the back of a truck and shaking with cold, fear and pain, we passed another medical convoy that had driven off into a ditch, we realized that none of them had survived, all were dead. They made it, we said. A little later and our truck went into the ditch. I told my moaning and screaming wounded comrades that this was the end. I could still walk and offered to go for help. They discouraged me the probability of falling into the hands of the Russians was too high, and help was coming. Only one of them stood up to go with me, despite the laceration in his leg. I supported him, and so we waddled slowly. I don't know how, but at dawn we reached Karpovka station. The last thing I saw was the sign, Garrison Commandant's Office. When I came to my senses again, there was my comrade beside me, 
and with him a Russian old man and his wife. They told me that German tanks retreating had passed us. In order not to be crushed, they dragged me to the side of the road, to the ditch, to the dead. At the old men's house I quickly recovered and in two hours I had enough strength to carry my comrade on a sled that the old man had made for us. In front of us was the runway of the Potomac airfield. From time to time trucks passed by us. But soon my strength left me again. At the slope sat many German soldiers, absolutely exhausted, waiting for death. They say the white death is merciful. There was an unusual, strange silence. Perhaps it was a prostration in which pain, hunger, suffering and homesickness finally end. We pulled up beside them. The trucks did not stop for fear of being stormed by our pitiful remnants. Wanting to hasten the inevitability of my fate I lay across the track hoping to be run over. But I was not. The truck that was supposed to run me over, slowed down, and picked up me and my comrade. That's how we got to the airfield. Here my wounded man's card, which said that my arm had to be amputated, turned into a return ticket. The same thing happened to my comrade. On the night of January 11th to 12th, we were loaded into airplanes and taken back to life. Among the 24 airplanes that were there, the Junkers 90 seemed especially reliable to us because of its size. But the two of us got seats in another airplane, next to the radio operator. In the air I noticed by the mood in the cockpit that something was wrong. What it was, I realized only after landing in Salsk. Nine machines were shot down, including that Junkers 90. In the unheated cockpit of the airplane I almost froze my feet off. I'll never forget how the pilot and the radio operator brought us bread and marmalade, a whole basket. I cried like a baby. Here I am, sitting alive and with marmalade. Soon after that I heard that the kennel was occupied by the Russians, almost immediately after our airplane got me out of hell. We were driven toward home in freight cars. At the Reich border a real medical train was waiting for us. I got a window seat after all. I was a Stalingrad citizen.